Hello, welcome to the Friday, December 18th, 2020 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida, but teaching virtually in Washington, D.C. I'm teaching the Defending Web Application Security class. If you are interested in learning more about how to defend web applications, the next run of this class will be on January 11th, and you'll find links to the class in the show notes. GitHub announced that starting August 13th next year, you will no longer be able to use passwords when you're authenticating Git operations. So if you're making updates to your repository, if you're pushing code, you will need either an OAuth key, a GitHub app installation, or you need to use SSH in order to push the update. And then of course, SSH with keys. Until then, you should be looking out for any warnings that you're using an outdated third-party integration. That may mean that your client does not support these authentication methods and you should definitely update. Also, in order to essentially warn developers of this change, GitHub will implement two brownouts as they call it. This will happen on June 30th and July 28th during a couple of hours on each day, you will be unable to log in with password and basically they will temporarily already implement the behavior that will become normal on August 13th to kind of give you a warning that it's now really time to update your authentication. Of course, what they're trying to solve here is phishing that has often been used in the past to gain access to developers GitHub repositories and then has been used to compromise code and inject backdoors, for example. This has been a change that was in the works for quite a while. It's really just an update on this uh, change in policy next August. There was some talk around an open solar winds GitHub repository that include uh, the credentials for an FTP server. Haven't really been able to confirm any of that. Uh, those rumors appear to be based on a single source. And this announcement is unlikely related to anything happening with SolarWinds. And one of the big criticisms when it comes to Android is how difficult it can be uh, to keep Android up to date. And of course, Google is here a little bit in a disadvantaged position compared to Apple with Google having to deal with a wide range of hardware manufacturers and of course, uh, telecommunication operators that they need to cooperate with in order to make an update life. In a blog post now, uh, Google does give a good overview of uh, their efforts uh, to make, to change uh, how their updates work and to make them easier to adopt. For example, in more recent versions, they actually uh, didn't do too bad in getting people to adopt, for example, Android 10 relatively quickly. And at this point, Android 11 does look like it's at least as quickly adopted as Android 10. The big partner here for Google is Qualcomm with most of the Android hardware building being built around the Qualcomm Snapdragon platform. One of the problems in the past has been sort of to retain that backward compatibility with older versions of that chip. And Google is trying to address some of this now. And if you're interested in all the nitty little details in how this will happen, if you are an Android user, you may want to take a look at the Android developer blog. I'm not sure how often I've mentioned in this podcast that admin consoles for various security appliances should not be exposed. This tends to be a little more difficult if uh, these appliances are cloud-based. Latest example is Trend Micro's Interscan Web Security Virtual Appliance. Trend Micro did address uh, five different vulnerabilities. At least five of them are rated high in the IWSVA version 6.5 Service Pack 2. An attacker would be able to completely take over an affected device and gain admin access to the panel. 
malicious code could be executed using root privileges. So certainly something that you want to address probably before the holidays. And in order to do so, apply version 6.5 service pack to CPB 1919. And sadly, malicious browser extensions are still a thing and still popular. Avast identified 28 different browser extensions with uh, several million installs among them. Now, uh, these browser extensions, they sort of tied into some popular social media sites like video downloaders, for example, for Facebook, Vimeo, and Instagram, as well as trying to claim that they're able to unblock certain content. These browser extensions were available for Google Chrome and with Microsoft Edge being based on Google Chrome, of course, also offered for Microsoft's browser. I do recommend to do a regular cleanup of browser extensions if you are into that. And in general, do minimize browser extensions that you install. Well, this is it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday.